Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. This is one of those stories sent to me by everybody, and it covers a lot of things we touched on before, but it has an interesting twist. So this version is from Motorious by Elizabeth Puckett. Judge orders sheriff's office to return seized 1968 Camaro. And we've talked before about stolen Camaros uh, and also stolen cars and stolen cars being returned many years later. So in Baldwin County, Circuit Judge Clark Stankowski recently issued a firm ruling against the county's sheriff's office for the improper and illegal seizure of a 1968 Camaro belonging to a man there. The twist in the tale is the car is currently with a Kansas man who reported the car stolen two decades ago, who claims to be the original and authentic owner of the car. So as you can imagine, car gets stolen, changes hands a bunch of times, somewhere down the road, someone doesn't know they've got a stolen car. And those things do pop up from time to time when they check the vehicle identification numbers. The judge previously ruled against the sheriff's office, and he has now given them and the state of Alabama a 43-day ultimatum to return the vehicle back to the man who had it originally in this case. While the Baldwin County District Attorney indicated he'll likely appeal, he refrained from commenting further on the case. Now, the controversy stems from the local man's purchase of the Camaro back in 2016. So this guy's had the car for a while. After an investigation by the Alabama Department of Revenue, they linked the vehicle identification number to a stolen vehicle. So the Baldwin County Sheriff's deputies demanded this man to surrender the car, saying it's a stolen car, it's got to go back to the original owner. Following his refusal, they executed a warrant and seized the vehicle, handing it over to the man in Kansas just minutes before a temporary restraining order was issued. And by the way, this is one of those situations where a TRO would be highly appropriate. Because you have a situation where a guy locally says, this car is mine. I can prove it's mine. Someone in another state goes, no, I think it's mine. And the police investigate that, well, we think it belongs to the guy in the other state. Before you ship the car off the other state, maybe have a couple hearings or something. Do some investigation. Let the parties come into court and hash it out. And so the sheriff apparently just said, no, we're going to grab the car and ship it back to where it belongs. That's what we think should be done. And a court issued a temporary restraining order, but apparently they issued it literally just a few minutes too late. The judge criticized the sheriff's office's approach, stating that using a criminal process to facilitate a civil remedy was illegal. And so that's the question. If this person's got the car, there's no allegation that they knew it was stolen. There's no allegation they're involved in the theft. And he is what we call a good faith purchaser, meaning he simply he bought it from somebody, believing it was legitimately being sold to him by its true owner. The guy selling it to him might not have known anything about it either. And so it seems that you actually should somehow get to the bottom of that if there's a dispute before you just ship the car out of state. Because that's the problem. Because now that you ship the car out of state, to get it back, it gets really, really messy. So one of the things that the courts look at before issuing a temporary restraining order is whether or not it'll be easier to fix now with everything status quo. Again, not the band from England, although I love their work. Or if we let things change and then have to undo them later. And so sometimes it's like, hey, everybody, calm down, freeze. Stop. Everybody stop. Stop. We've all been in those situations before where somebody goes, everybody just stop. Okay? Let's try to resolve this now as opposed to letting stuff happen and then try to fix it later. So the judge noted that none of the deputies involved considered the man with the car locally under criminal investigation, nor did they ever intend to make an arrest. Therefore, them seeking a warrant was improper, and the judge says illegal. Now, a lot of people will throw that word illegal around, but when it comes to who you don't want throwing it at you would be a judge. Just I'm just pro it's a pro tip right there, okay? <laughs> the local man's defense is that he legally acquired the car from another resident who had owned it for several years himself. His attorney argues that the VIN matching a stolen car was from a replaced part and didn't reflect the car's true identity. Now, 
unfortunately, I know a lot about 68, 69 Camaros. <laughs> the reason I say that is I've been involved in litigation involving them, more than one. I've represented owners of Camaros on at least two occasions I can think of. We'll talk about it in a second. So the judge's ruling didn't dig into the ownership dispute, but suggested simply that the matter should be resolved in the correct forum with maybe, I don't know, testimony from witnesses and so on. Case highlights the complexities of car ownership disputes, particularly involving vintage vehicles with murky histories, especially from other states that have a history of being stolen. That's always a problem. So we've talked about this before, and if you don't believe me, you can look this up. But in the old days, the vehicle identification number was always in a couple different places on the car. Nowadays, it's in even more. But back then, it was just in a couple places. So quite often, quite often, there is a VIN tag at the base of the A pillar underneath the windshield, top of the dashboard, so that to see it, you walk up to the car and look through the window glass. You can see it from the outside of the car if it's not covered. That's the one most people check. However, those tags can be replaced. It is illegal to do so unless you really know what you're doing and have got a good reason to do it. But VIN tags are something most people shouldn't be messing with. However, if you find yourself buying a 68 Camaro and you're wondering about its provenance, the vehicle identification number is stamped in two other places that are basically stamped into metal inside the car. One of them, for instance, is on a piece of metal that is on the front side of the firewall that to see, you might need a dental mirror, okay? So, if this attorney is arguing that the VIN on this car simply came off a stolen car, but the rest of the car is okay, <laughs> it seems highly unlikely, unless we're talking about literally the entire front clip of a car, and in which case, the front clip is like, I don't know, might not be half the car, but it's a good chunk of the car if it includes the firewall. And so I don't know how likely that argument is. But I can tell you, for instance, I had a 1969 Dodge Charger, first car I owned in high school. And uh, the VIN, I'm pretty certain, could also be found if you popped the deck lid and peeled back the weather stripping in the trunk. Because a lot of Mopars from that era would stamp the VIN into that edge there of the trunk underneath the weather stripping. Okay? So... You might say, but Steve, you know, what if the car got rear-ended and somebody chopped off the back end of the car and put it? Yes, that can happen. Absolutely, that can happen. And so, once in a while, uh, there can be missing VINs or VIN mismatches, and that can happen. So, the real question is the bulk of the car, okay? The bulk of the car. <laughs> but it very well could be that, and I hate to say this, but you got to hire experts, and I've actually... All, all in, in this discussion with you right now, everyone here has raised, you know, raise your hand if you've hired a 1968 Camaro expert. I actually hired a guy who wrote books on Camaros, and I hired him to render an opinion. And so it might be the parties have got to bring in Camaro experts and have them say, yes, I examined this car, and it appears to me that this is original, this is original, but this is not. Or it's all original except for that VIN tag got swapped. I mean, I don't know, but, but the judge is right that you find the car locally and we have a report that the VIN that we found on the car somewhere matches the VIN of a car stolen in another state. We think it should go back to that guy. But we're not going to charge this person here with anything. There's no crime committed here. There's, there's no wrongdoing here. We're just going to take the car from the guy and ship it out of state. The judge is right. The car is here person who has paperwork indicating that they got the car legally also they've got that so to resolve this we should resolve it here um because now once you've shipped it over there if you're wrong you gotta ship it back and so it just seems more simple and straightforward to handle it locally and so there's also the problem that they went and apparently got a criminal warrant and you know Warrants are mentioned in the, uh, in the what's that thing called? Uh, the Constitution. <laughs> and um, if you get a, a warrant 
indicating there's an underlying criminal case. Where is the criminal case? Oh, there isn't one. Oh, then why'd you use that kind of a warrant? Why'd you do that? You know, so there were probably better ways to handle this. And the judge seems to think so. So I would tend to agree with the judge. And this, again, is going to get us back to a lot of people are going to comment in the comments below the video and say, Steve, the car got stolen in Kansas, winds up down in Alabama. The insurance company owns it now. And, and everyone says that. Everyone says that. And yet, when they ran the VIN, the last titled owner was the guy up in Kansas. And a lot of insurance companies don't bother retitling stolen vehicles because they figure they'll never get found. And most of them, by the way, aren't. Not, not classic old cars like that. So what happens is the insurance company pays it off and the owner goes, you want the title? They go, nah. Because for them to retitle it in their name, paperwork, and also there might be some liability there uh, in the sense that they might now own something. And for bookkeeping purposes, do you put on the books that you own this Camaro that you don't actually have possession of? And so I've done research on this and insurance companies, generally speaking, quite often do not, do not title the cars in their names after they've been reported stolen and are paid off as a total loss. So quite often the last titled owner is the person from whom it was stolen. And so when the police find a stolen vehicle, they go, okay, who's the last titled owner? This guy, boom, give it to him. Now, of course, we're getting back to whether we take it from this person to give it to him. Another story altogether. I'm simply talking hypotheticals here. So it's a crazy story, but two things can happen. The um, district attorney could appeal this order and get a higher court to overturn it. Or, or uh, this judge and the guy locally may take steps to get it back. But of course, if a judge issues an order saying this car must be returned here, uh, the problem, of course, is that the order then is going to get taken to another state. And will another state honor that? And that's another mess altogether, which we won't get into right now. But the story is from Motorious. A lot of people sent it to me. Thank you very much. 1968 Camaro was seized, and the judge has now ordered the sheriff's office to return it. And it's a mess. Questions or comments? Put them below. Let's talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. Think of unhappiness as a job you've walked out on.